And also on behalf of uh, my co-chair, Rachel Dury, and myself, I think we have an exciting one hour to fill with four um, communications in the late breaking oral communications. And uh, those are the ones that came in late because they have very fresh results and, uh, and not yet um, uh, mentioned or published anywhere else. Um, so I think we should uh, immediately start. And, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce my co-chair, Rachel Dury formerly known as uh, the expert on Alzheimer's disease in, in Texas and the rest of the world. And now she has moved to Basel uh, and is leading the program at Roche. Rachel. Well, thank you for the opportunity to present these results today, which I hope will be informative to the field. So, there are some slides that go with, okay. Um, my co-authors are represented here, and uh, this work was largely done by the clinical pharmacology group at Roche, who have done fantastic work. So I'm talking today about one of the two monoclonal antibodies under development at Roche. Um, this is gantanerumab, a fully human anti-A beta uh, monoclonal antibody, IgG1 backbone, binds to and removes aggregated amyloid through FC gamma receptor-mediated microglial phagocytosis, and in preclinical models, prevents further amyloid beta aggregation. Um, efficacy and safety will be assessed now in a global phase three uh, program with two phase three studies, graduate one and two. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what led to the study design of these studies. So a very brief history of gantanerumab, 10 years of uh, learnings, beginning with a multiple ascending dose study. And you'll notice that gantanerumab at that time was being tested intravenously in 2008, where we saw an effect on um, brain amyloid and Alzheimer's disease patients. This led to a phase two study called Scarlet Road in prodromal Alzheimer's disease. And even in those early days in 2010, subjects were selected on the basis of amyloid positivity. The goal was to assess efficacy and safety of what we now think of as much lower doses of gantanerumab. We were happy to join the Diane study um, of familial Alzheimer's disease in 2012. And I can tell you that in 2016, the dose of gantanerumab was increased in that study. And then Scarlet Road migrated from a phase two study to a phase three study, still prodromal um, Alzheimer's disease patients. And Marguerite Road was also launched in the 2012 um, era in mild Alzheimer's disease. However, by 2014, a formal futility analysis of the um, the, the Scarlet Road study suggested that it would be futile to continue this study the way it was being conducted. And for that reason, both Scarlet Road and Marguerite Road were converted to open label extension studies. And I will go through briefly the data that suggested that that was a good move rather than simply stopping the development of this drug. Um, analysis of the data from Scarlet Road suggested that um, amyloid removal was taking place and uh, safety and tolerability seemed pretty good. So the open label extension study was used to explore ways to increase the dose of gantanerumab. The graduate studies, as I mentioned, are two phase three studies that will be initiated early next year in a prodromal to mild population and uh, as you look over this timeline, by 2010, uh, we had switched from intravenous to subcutaneous administration of gantanerumab. So um, what were the designs of these studies? Uh, Scarlet Road screened over 3,000 people with prodromal Alzheimer's disease. And as I mentioned, they had to have evidence of amyloid by CSFA beta. They were randomized one to one about 800 people, to placebo, 105 milligrams a month of subcutaneous gantanerumab, or 225 milligrams per month, with the primary endpoint being 
CDR sum of the box changed from baseline compared to placebo at two years. Marguerite Road was in a more advanced population, about 400 people, one to one. In this case, everybody started at 105 milligrams subcutaneously um, for six months and then increased to 225 milligrams with the same, um, with a different primary endpoint, 8-ASCOG-13, and a co-primary ADCS-ADL because this was in a clinically established AD population, which required the dual outcomes. And then when the futility analysis in December of 2014 suggested it was futile to go on with the prodromal study, um, dosing was suspended. There was a treatment-free follow-up period before people began to be dosed again. But post hoc analysis, which is always fraught with danger, nonetheless suggested that there may be a reason to go forward. What was it that was seen? Well, there seemed to be an exposure-dependent relationship um, with SUVR lowering on amyloid PET. On the graph on the left, <clears throat> what you see are placebo, low exposure, medium exposure, and high exposure levels. This is changed from baseline um, in PET SUVR with numbers below the dotted line being reductions. And so there seemed to be an exposure-related increase in reduction in SUVR. So it's um, suggested that something was happening, at least with respect to this biomarker. On the graph on the right, you see um, an analysis, also a post hoc analysis, looking at what were defined as fast progressors. Why look at fast progressors only? Well, because not much was happening in slow progressors. There, there were just no changes in cognition. So in an exploratory way, we looked at change from baseline in 8S COG 13 levels <clears throat> with scores above the dotted line representing increases or worsening. This is time. And again, exposure groups, placebo, low, medium, and high dose, suggested that with greater exposures, there was less worsening on the 8S COG. So a model was created, and that's really the point of the discussion today, a PKPD model um, informed both by Scarlet Road and by published data from another monoclonal antibody to really investigate, well, what, what could we predict about um, possible pharmacodynamic effects based upon dose? We felt that we needed to target a minimal level of amyloid reduction of 20%. And this begins to get at least some members of the population close toward uh, the threshold level. Again, data from Scarlet Road and published monoclonal antibody data. And you can see the 105 milligram dose, the 225 milligram dose. The model predicted that in order to reach the targeted 20% SUVR reduction, we would need to, to have a dose of about 1,200 milligrams of subcutaneous scantinarumab. And also, the model suggested that there would continue to be increases in SUVR reduction out as far as two years. Of course, the big worry was also ARIA. Um, anytime we, we push the dose of a monoclonal antibody that's uh, targeting aggregated A-beta, we worry about uh, ARIA. And so another model was created that actually modeled ARIA as a function of dose. It was already clear from Scarlet Road, but also from the literature, that ARIA risk is driven by APOE4 status, drug concentration, and time since first dose, because most of the ARIA takes place in the first several months. So these curves were drawn. Um, this is ARIA incidence. This is predicted uh, ARIA incidence percent. Um, the two lines represent a fast titration sc scheme and a slow titration scheme. And you know, multiple titration schemes were investigated, but this gives you an example of a fast scheme at which you would reach the 1,200 milligram dose in nine months and a slow scheme in which you would reach it three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 months um, with a different 
approach, starting with a lower dose. So we, we thought we might be able to predict that if you, if you moved quickly, you'd have 40% aria at the target dose, whereas if you moved more slowly, you would be closer to 25%, and that the PET amyloid reduction would um, be in the target range. So the open-label extension study was, in fact, used to test the hypothesis that titration would lead to the target doses with controllable aria risk. And um, this was very much necessary in order to take next steps of moving to large phase three studies with higher doses. This is a busy slide. Um, the message that you should take from this slide is that we were very careful about designing the titration depending on the experience that the patients had had in the double blind. So if they started, for example, on placebo or 105 milligrams in Scarlet Road and they were an APOE4 carrier, they got a rather slow titration. And so all of these factors were taken into account in designing these various titration schedules. And this is um, the slide that compares the prediction to what was actually seen. This model um, continuously fed into the model what was being observed in terms of ARIA incidence in the open label study. And in the blue zone, what you see is the ARIA E predicted over time, um, with starting out no ARIA and then up to somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of people developing ARIA. And the black line is the mean and 90% confidence of intervals of what we actually observed. So the model was actually quite good at predicting what was going to happen. It predicted an overall RAE incidence of 23% with all genotypes. And the observed incidence was 26%. Oh, and I, I want to make the point that if you want to learn more about this um, result, please see uh, Mariana's presentation on Friday. So um, the prediction about ARIA held. What about the prediction on SUVR reduction? The observed amyloid reduction was in line with the, the PET model predictions, up to 0.27 mean SUVR change from baseline, uh, depending on the titration scheme, with greater and consistent amyloid reduction seen with higher doses, about a third of the patients in this open label study actually fell below the amyloid positivity threshold. And if you would like to learn more about what we saw on the PET study, um, Greg Klein will be speaking in a moment. So in summary, um, there were some learnings from this PKPD modeling and the open label extension study. We were able to feed the data in continuously from the open label to confirm the model and build confidence in going forward with this molecule. Gantanarumab at higher doses significantly reduces brain amyloid. Uh, we think we're able to optimize a titration schedule that reduces the risk of aria E, and it is a single titration schedule. It's not different for APOE4 carriers and non-carriers. And the model also supports a 24-month duration to our phase three trials. So in conclusion, um, these results support exploring higher doses of gantanarumab in the graduate phase three programs with an optimized uh, titration scheme. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rochelle. And uh, we have time for some questions. And speak up, please, and find a microphone because I really can't see any of you. Oh, now it's better. No questions? Not even in the back? Just, Rachel, remind me, what was the dose that you used in the phase one study? Do you remember? In the phase one study? Yeah. The um, well, it was intravenous, so it, it, it was How basically was it? comparable to the lower doses. To the lower dose, okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Rachel. If there are no more questions, we'll move on, but we'll stay on the same uh, theme, and we'll also stay in the same team. I see a question. Well, still yeah, there. sorry, Adam. Adam Fleischer from Lilly. Thanks. I know you probably can't see me. No. Quick question. Um, Lilly, 
I, a very nice presentation. Thank you for sharing that data, Rochelle. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, impact of titration on REH, did you see any? Were there any concerns with microhemorrhages? I don't know if you can share any of that or if titration yes, helped I, with that. I, I think you will see more of that in uh, Mirjana's paper, but basically uh, REH has been uh, not a big, a big adverse event for us as it hasn't been for others as well. So um, I'm not always certain that REH is completely related to therapy. You know, as you know, we see, a, we see some REH in placebo groups as well, but there is certainly a, a little bit higher incidence, and we think the titration scheme um, supports better ARIA outcomes in general. Thank you. 